Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined once again by Dr. Larry Chapp, a retired professor of theology who taught at DeSales University for over 20 years. He is now the owner and manager of the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. With Dr. Larry Chapp, we go inside the pages of Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness, published by Ignatius Press. We now continue with part two of our conversation. We now face what I call in the book the nullification of our religious sense in, in some very troubling ways. But Resource Mont formed the foundation then for the Second Vatican Council and the entire theologies of Ratzinger and Pope John Paul and so on. If that things that we never could have had access to even maybe 25 years ago, I mean, I'm most thinking of Maximus the Confessor his writing. I mean, just the average Joe like me who can go online and look and find these writings now that are in English. And what they have to offer us is a fuller vision of what the church is and provides us lights. It's almost, and I don't mean to go on about my own experience, but it, it is really revelatory for me to be able to read Bonaventure who is writing at the same time as Aquinas, and yet presents and is as brilliant. He's a doctor of the church, too. They taught at the same university, and his approach to it speaks to my heart much more strongly than, say, Aquinas. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up Bonaventure, because the theology of Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict, is very popular among very many people, because they, too, find his theology very refreshing, very profound, profound in some different kinds of ways. And the fact of the matter is, Joseph Ratzinger was more influenced by Bonaventure than he was by Thomas Aquinas, which causes a lot of Thomistic types to get kind of upset with Ratzinger because he seems to ignore Aquinas in favor of Bonaventure. But Ratzinger was a kind of Augustinian in his soul, and Bonaventure, of course, was more Augustinian, I think, than, than Aquinas, although Aquinas had a great love for Augustine as well. Both you and I, I mean, you were born and raised in Nebraskans. We're Nebraskans. And that's right. I hazard to say we're, we're kind of practical folks. And as those who are listening to us now or watching us, they're going to say, well, that's all nice. But how does that pertain to me? And this different way, Bonaventure describes it this way. Aquinas describes it this way. I think that's at the heart of your book in a very real way, uh, Larry, is that in the church, there's the opportunities to have these discussions and to look at things in different lights. Unfortunately, right now, are we in a period where it seems as though it has to be this way? That's the way people are hearing it now. It has to be this way and not that way. Don't even look over there. Don't even, don't be open to having the conversation because your eternal salvation is at stake. And I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm not trying to say that that course that's important. I want to reverence that. But it has gotten maybe just a bit out of hand. I mean, people might be rolling their eyes at me right now. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a lot at stake here. Is the Ever since the Second Vatican Council was over, okay, there was, a, in my view, as Ratzinger's and many others, and De Lubach and Dietrich von Hildebrand and a whole host of Dietrich von Hildebrand wrote a book called The Trojan Horse and the City of God, and it was about the sort of liberal, if you want to put it that way, the liberal takeover of the church in many ways after the council. So the council's message was kind of co-opted in favor of this very progressive agenda, which kind of then set the tone for the counter-reaction, which was then the trads arise and uber-conservative Catholics arise. And so these hardened camps begin to develop in which they don't want to talk to each other. They don't want to listen to each other. My ecclesial vision is the only proper one, not this other one over here. And it speaks to a certain politicization of ecclesiology and, and our approach to the church where, you know, uh, my antecedent commitments to a set of causes 
trumps a deeper and more profound ecclesiology. So I often like to say that these modern camps, the progressives versus the traditionalists, are often, in both sides, conclusions in search of an argument. They have a set of antecedent political commitments and political vision. That's why you notice you know, so many traditionalists within the Catholic Church are so pro-Trump and pro-very conservative American politics, whereas the progressives are all in favor of LGBTQ and the left wing politically and so forth. Uh, and it seems like, well, what's being lost is, well, what is the true Catholic position in all of this? And popes like John Paul and Benedict tried to chart a course between those things and to say, let's calm down. I mean, the sort of accusation, for example, that JP2 and Ratzinger were these two harsh disciplinarians that suppressed all dissent can only be believed by someone who didn't live in that era. You know, I was in seminary during that time and then in graduate school during that time. And to say that, in a sense, liberal Catholicism had been repressed is beyond silly. The camps remain. And so in some ways, JP2 and Benedict, though they tried hard, those camps still remain and they don't want to talk to each other. And that's unfortunate because there are truths that both sides are raised. For example, let me use one example. It's a bit of a tangent. I have been critical in print of Cardinal McElroy, who came out in America magazine and said, you know, we need to have this radically inclusive church. And he's obviously talking about gays and so forth. And he goes, isn't it a shame that in our moral theology, every sexual sin is considered a grave sin, but other sins are not, and that's kind of skewed. And so, of course, I, I was critical of him for a silly notion of inclusivity that was more sociological than theological. And obviously, he doesn't mean total include. He wouldn't include KKK members or neo-Nazis in his inclusive church. He's clearly just talking about more inclusion in the sexual domain and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm opposed to him. Nevertheless... Nevertheless, and, and others say, well, we're not going to listen to McElroy. Nevertheless, he has a point. And his point is that perhaps we have as a church in certain, certain, not on the magisterial level, but on a certain boots on the ground level, overemphasized sexual morality to the point of exclusion of so many other very, very central moral issues. Now, I disagree with him on where he wants to take that, but he's got a fundamental insight there about a certain obsession with sexual morality that some Catholics seem to have. And so that's where I could sit down with McElroy and have a beer and, you know, and say, let's talk about this. And yet there are people that wouldn't want to talk to him. Yeah, I think what you just did is key. You didn't go after his personhood. You didn't go after him personally. You didn't describe him as the, the worst thing that ever happened. You presented where his stances were, but you didn't shut the door to at least seeing where his insights are coming from for him and what his movement is and that, you know, you want to have the conversation with him. We're losing that, I think, in some cases, or it, we're challenged by that at the very least. And I'm not sure it's because we're at this point where we just are, we have sound bites or maybe possible investments of career legacies or whatever that might be to have that Christian charity to be able to have, to explore and to, to get to know things better. We just don't have the time anymore, it seems. I don't have the time to even bother. I just make that snap judgment. And central to, yeah, we do make snap judgments and we live in memes and sound bites. You know, I avail myself of social media and so on. So I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say, oh, social media are, are horrible. They're not. But social media, one of its downfalls is it does lend itself to this kind of superficial meme sort of thinking where we, our thinking is balkanized. We tend to only bookmark on our internet pages, you know, those echo chambers that we agree with, and we don't bookmark the ones that we don't agree with. And so we end up listening only, you know, we, we preach to the choir and we listen to our own choir and we, we don't listen enough to the other side, to what others are saying. And we are all baptized brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it cuts to the heart of Dorothy Day and Peter Moore and in their sense of love of enemies. Love of enemies means also our intellectual interlocutors, which means we need to read them charitably and not to immediately assume, oh, Cardinal McElroy must be gay himself and he must have a lot of gay friends and he just wants to green light gayness. Well, you know, how do you know that? I mean, what, what could possibly lead you to such an uncharitable reading of what he had to say. Maybe he's just a man with a certain displaced compassion. That's what I view it as, is a kind of, you know, as C.S. Lewis pointed out in his book, The Problem of Pain, he says, you know, the kindness is a virtue. 
But if kindness is our only virtue, it can flip on itself and become a very unmerciful and unkind sort of thing, unless it's wedded to truth and true charity and so on. So in many ways, I, I view, in a sense, the opposition to my sort of traditional moral theology as engaging in a kind of displaced, compassionate, a, a sort of exaggerated kindness. Okay, but I can talk to them about that and, and learn things. But let, let's not rush in to impute all of these evil motives to people. Yeah, because the damage that it can do to us, our own sanctity, that universal call to holiness, I don't think we, we can see that sometimes. I mean, you can have Jerome and St. Jerome and St. Augustine, who obviously had a, an incredible disagreement about something, and yet they were able to still live out that universal call to holiness, and they were able to become saints. I don't know if we're aware that sometimes in the conversations and the culminy, and the last time I checked, culminy and detraction, there's still sins. They're still on the books and they're still sins. Now, all that being said, I'm kind of being critical of traditionalists here, and I don't really mean to be overly critical of them. I think, once again, to understand their motives, that they've sort of been, to use a common term, they've been a bit red-pilled by things that are going on in the church today. So people that were formerly sort of just sort of John Paul II type conservative Catholics have been red pilled into a kind of radical traditionalism in, in a sort of reactive posture. And I need to understand that. I need to talk to them about that. Because the fact is, and here I'm going to be a little bit critical of Pope Francis, if you don't mind. I mean, I admire Pope Francis. He has said many wonderful things. He's not a heretic. He's the true Pope and all these kinds of things. Uh, and that's the kind of calumny you're talking about. He's an anti-pope. You know, he's, he's, he's a heretic. I don't know. None of that. Nevertheless, he talks a lot about dialogue, and he talks a lot about perhesia, as he calls it, this open-ended dialogue where all voices get to be heard. And the upcoming synod in October is supposedly about, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's hear everybody's voices. And yet, what he gives with one hand, he seems to take away with the other. And I'm thinking, for example, of, of documents like Traditiones Custodes, where he's just sort of slammed shut the door on the traditionalists and, and the traditional Latin mass. And, and he seems to be saying, let's listen to everybody except for these people over here on the right wing of the church. And I don't think that's pastorally healthy. So even though I'm critical of the traditionalists for not paying attention to the good points that progressives make, I think in many ways they're reacting to the fact that progressives are very domineering themselves. I lived under it in seminary and graduate school where I had to fight tooth and nail at Fordham to even get a dissertation on Balthazar Dunn because it was dominated by a bunch of progressive runarians. All right. And, and so, yeah, it cuts both ways. And I just don't see how either camp these days is really making an attempt to reach out to the other side. We need reconciliation in the church and forgiveness. And we, yeah, we need dialogue. We need listening. We need hearing. We need mutuality. We need all of those buzzwords. Behind those buzzwords is a true Christian reality. Unfortunately, they've been co-opted in a very superficial sociologistic way to be code words for simply, well, we're just going to impose our agenda, whether you like it or not, which is crazy. So yeah, I, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm on a bit of a rant and rave here now. But to me, this is an absolutely critical moment in the church's history where we need to lower, sheathe our swords, all right, and sit down and listen to each other. Yeah. And the thing is, when you do that, sometimes, believe it or not, there's going to be a suffering, even in the listening to the other, because it's easier just to put up a wall around ourselves and say, this is what I know. This is what I believe. I'm protected by this. But if I listen to that other person, I might have to encounter their pain. Or maybe, just maybe, it will hit something deep down inside of me that's a wound, it's a pain. And so suffering in the Christian life, hey, there's no way around it. You're going to see, just being a human being, you're going to suffer. But as a Christian, this is, the key is suffering. And that we have to be willing to enter into it, even if it means sometimes the dialogue that we would rather not, I use the term dialogue but not in the context of what you just did, but I mean more of that listening to others and their points and not be so quick to judge them. Am I making sense? You're making perfect sense. I mean, it comprises a, a couple chapters in my book where I talk about evangelization and that to properly evangelize, one has to know the criticisms and disagreements with the faith 
from our unbelieving interlocutors, we have to know those things better than they do. We have to have thought them through. Now, that means we have to listen to them. And it means we have to try and develop a kind of empathetic form of thinking. When we enter into their thoughts, even when we profoundly disagree with them, in order to take the inner ethos of those thoughts into our own souls, into our own hearts, and to suffer them through, and to try and plumb their depths and get to the heart of what the deeper, deeper wound is, the deeper issue is that we're dealing with here, and to thereby then propose Christ as the answer to those deep and profound questions. But if we're constantly simply reacting by falling back into our camps, and this goes for both progressives and traditionalists, then that sort of deep, empathetic listening is not possible. And it's got to be Christologically grounded, too. I mean, I'm just not talking about some sort of therapeutic theory here of empathetic listening. It involves vicarious suffering through. This is the vocation of a true Christian, to take into oneself the suffering of the world as Christ did and to vicariously suffer through it for the sake of that world. And so once again, this involves love of enemies. And this goes to the point, too, that what we're talking about here, what Dorothy Day talks about and what I'm talking about in my book, is that in, 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 in developing this Ernstfall, this, this crisis moment in which we have to make an answer to the idolatries of the modern world, it doesn't involve a retreat into, let's run to the hills, let's become like modern day Essenes in Qumran. The Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls out there in Qumran in the desert, you know, awaiting judgment for all those others. Um, we can't develop Catholic compounds with our buried school buses, as I like to say, and so on. We have, to, it, it, we have to engage the world. Yes, it's important to have intentional communities. Yes, it's important to have a strong Catholic self-identity in those communities. But that is specifically in order for us to understand and know our faith well enough that we can then go out without fear, without defensiveness, and engage the world. And this last point about defensiveness is key, because the hallmark of the defensive evangelist is one who doesn't really believe what he's preaching at all rather deeply and is challenged by doubt because he shares those doubts and he's trying to talk his way out of them, okay? But instead of doing that, own those doubts, suffer through them, come out the tunnel on the other side, a stronger and deeper evangelist. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions, which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages.
We're talking to Dr. Larry Chapp about his book, Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. Amen. I love that. This is why I love this book. I'm trying to go through all the different tabs because there's so many things I want folks to hear in this work. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important that they go out and get a copy and to give it some time is that we hear so much about the Eucharistic revival. And you can't suffer that unless you have that grace that comes through the liturgy. And in particular, the Eucharistic liturgy. You say the Eucharistic liturgy is a rupturing of the fabric of time and space, the tearing open of a veil, the exploding of old wineskins, the absurd and ecstatic leap of the creature at prayer into supernatural joy. And see, that's what are we evangelizing? If we're not bringing people to that, instead our message is something that repels them, what is the point? I mean, who have we embraced? Oh, exactly. Balthazar, in a little book called St. Paul's Struggles with His Congregation, and it's a very pithy little book, I encourage people to read it, points out that one of the most overlooked aspects of St. Paul's writings is his constant expression that the Christian faith brings us joy that we need to live in this joy and not to get bogged down in all of these various factions in the church that he was contending with and to realize the resurrection is good news, doggone it, and it should bring us joy, joy, joy. And yet our message is so often so dour, so negative. Currently sort of popular among some people in the church is this idea that, uh, and I could get into a little bit of trouble here, but this idea that unless we return to the days when we believe that most non-Catholics are in danger of going to hell, we're not going to properly evangelize anymore. Well, maybe that's true on a certain level. Maybe belief that most people are going to hell was a, a spur for evangelization back in the day. But when you think about it, is that a message? Is that a message that most people actually will respond to today? I mean, seriously, you go and evangelize, say, "Well, I'm evangelizing you because I believe that the path you are on is going to lead you to hell." And if you don't immediately accept what it is that I'm saying to you, if you reject it, then if you die now, you're going to go to hell. So, you know, the message is God loves you. But this same God who is love, if you don't accept that he is love and accept him into your heart, is going to break your leg someday and send you into eternal torment. Now, I'm not denying hell here. I'm not denying that the potential exists for people to go to hell. So please don't don't send me hateful emails. I'm not a universalist. Okay, I believe that hell is a potential thing. But what foot are we putting forward is the question here. Is the foot we are putting forward is the foot of St. You notice how St. Paul does not talk about hell very much. He talks about inheriting the kingdom or not inheriting the kingdom. And here are the virtues that lead to inheriting the kingdom. And here are the sins that lead you to being excluded from the kingdom. Uh, Instead, his message was one of constant joy, joy, joy. The resurrection brings this. The resurrection brings that. Embrace this God who now liberates you from the slavery of the capricious and arbitrary principalities and powers of this world. His message was that Christ breaks the bonds of sin, breaks the bonds of your slavery, and is therefore very positive and uplifting. It's a message of, you're already in hell. Come out of it. Come out of hell. I used to have a priest, my spiritual director in seminary, Father Morgan Roth, who would always greet me for spiritual direction. His first words always would sit down and come out of hell. He was German, so he had this thick ass, come out of hell. And that was his way of saying, you know, let's let's not be so forensic and legalistic in our thinking. Let's recognize that we all, because of our sins, already exist in a certain sense in hell. And what it is that Christ brings is a liberation from that hell here and now. And not worry so much about what are the rules governing who goes to heaven, who goes to hell when we die. You know, those are important questions, but they're not, I don't think they're the, the first question we should lead with. On that note, what I want to say on this, the kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's that perfect beatitude and the opportunity to say yes to that. And then what you just described about hell, it's that solitary confinement. It's all about the great trinity of me, myself, and I. And ultimately, after the hell that we can experience is that total isolation of the self totally contained in itself. You know, in these conversations, sometimes I hear about hell, 
and they are talking about how a certain mystics may or may not have seen anybody in hell. It's not that it's empty. It's just that if even you were to see someone in hell, that gives you a consolation because you know you're not alone. That's right. Hell, uh, hell is total aloneness. It is all about me. I have no one. There is no consolation. Even if I were trapped in a room with the worst of narcissists, at least I have a communion, maybe not a healthy one, but it's I'm at least with someone. Hell is you have no one but yourself. Even Tom Hanks had to take a volleyball and put a face on it. Oh, that's right. In Castaway. Wilson. Wilson. That's it, Wilson. He needed Wilson because he had to be with somebody. And that's what hell is, because that's the choice that we made. And the good news is you don't have to be alone. And that's the solidarity that Dorothy Day offered, was that you are not alone. And you write about that so beautifully in your book. Balthazar once said that one of the greatest writings ever on on salvation, heaven, hell, was C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. And the way Lewis describes hell in The Great Divorce is, of course, he says in The Problem of Pain that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. But in The Great Divorce, he shows that hell is this very gray, shadowy place that's in a constant state of dusk or near twilight. And you go to hell and you live in a house and it's possible for you, if you get don't get along with your neighbor, to instantaneously move to the next house over and then the next house. And so eventually what happens is that everybody in hell ends up living on the extreme, almost infinite peripheries of the city because they keep moving away from each other. They can't stand each other and they just want to be alone. And it becomes therefore harder and harder and harder for them to work their way back to the sort of bus terminal that can take them to heaven if they should so choose. But it's just a fascinating, the great divorce, I encourage everybody to read. It's a fascinating read. It's essentially Lewis's take on the psychology of sin and the possibility of self-damnation. What could possibly lead someone to want to be so alone and damn themselves that they would turn down the offer of heaven? Well, Lewis gives us this very astute psychological reading of sin as to exactly why it would be that someone would prefer that to heaven. It's, it's beautiful. I could spend hours and hours with you, Larry, and I know that I've already gone over the time that I promised you when I had begged you to come on and talk with us, and because I know you're so busy on the farm, and it's not lambing season yet, is it? No, we we stopped breeding our lambs for a lot of reasons, mainly because having rams around is nasty because rams are nasty, but we now have dairy goats and we breed them, and right now the busy thing on our farm is I'm building a new enclosure for our rapidly increasing the herd of dairy goats. This old man is having a hard time and my carpentry skills are lacking, but that's what's keeping me busy these days. Well, those are the important things. Those are the important things. In closing our conversation, at least today, any final thoughts? Just, yeah, that we're faced with a crisis today, a civilizational crisis, a crisis within the church. And that crisis consists of a need for us to make a decision for or against Christ, that we're either going to be intentional Christians in the future or we won't be Christians at all. Mm. And so we need to choose. I hope my choice is the right one. So My too. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Larry Chapp, so very much. Thank you, Chris. Well, Dr. Larry Chapp, we've gone inside the pages of Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will First, pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you find us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.